Hey, good afternoon to you. 507 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Russia, Russia, Russia interfering in our election again. Here's what was happening yesterday on MSNBC. I think this is a good sign. It's a shot across the bow to remind Americans of this kind of behavior. Uh, we talked a lot about it in 2016. We should have talked more about it in 2020, by the way. They did uh, various activities then. I applaud what uh, the, the Biden administration is doing right now to remind everybody that this is happening. They obviously have very good technology to, to uh, uncover what has happened. That's a good reminder to the Russians. And I think the very fact that they're doing this is, is a gentle reminder to all Americans to be careful about what they're reading when the source comes from Russia. And I want to remind everybody, you can go on X right now and find RT. The very people that are being indicted right now, they are freely tweeting, they are freely propagating their oh, disinformation no. in the United States. This is a good reminder, I think, to Americans of who these actors actually are working for. Russians are freely tweeting? Well, that's the end of the entire republic. That was Michael McFall yesterday, a former ambassador to Russia. Uh, but joining me now is an ambassador to America, uh, David Strom, associate editor for Hot Air. Uh, David, good to have you with us, as always. Hey, Vince, it's been way too long. I've missed you. <laughs> well, thanks for coming back. So, so uh, yeah, they, the Justice Department, in a very showy press conference yesterday, they had a long table, and every government official was there. They were there to tell us that Russia's interfering in our election again. Uh, they, they didn't really give us a lot of good details, but just trust them. Russia's interfering. Well, look, Vince, I actually think it's true that Russia is trying to interfere in our election, and so is China, and so is Iran, and mm -hmm. so is the U.K., so is the European Union. Don't forget, the European Union tried to shut uh, President Trump up and keep him off of uh, Twitter yeah. uh, because they don't like him. I mean, the simple fact is, is that Every country out there tries to influence every other country's election unless they don't really care. Yeah. I mean, in fact, we specialize you know, in that. The United States is very good yeah. at that, or we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. I mean, the, the funny thing is, is that the Russians are not particularly good at it. It's the Chinese uh, who have done more to interfere in our elections aside from our own uh government here i mean don't forget what the fbi the cia the justice department uh the new york uh, prosecutor's offices all of these guys yep. uh i think uh, in michigan uh uh they they're keeping cornell west off the ballot because he'll take votes from uh uh from uh, harris and they're keeping uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on the ballot, even though he's not running anymore. Right. And so, uh, I mean, let's face it. I mean, you know, foreign election interference is just, it's been going on forever. It's really hardly a problem compared to everything else that's going on in lawfare. Yes. Right now is our biggest problem. So who do you think is a bigger uh, interferer in American elections, the United States Department of Justice or Russia? Oh, it's not even close. The United States Department of Justice. I mean, they've been interfering in our elections going back to uh, at least 2015 and going after Donald Trump. They, yeah. uh, you know, they participated in what was probably the biggest hoax ever in American politics, the Steele dossier, which led to years of impeachment inquiries, a special counsel. It finally comes out that it's complete BS, and they knew it. And then, of course, in 2020, uh, you had the FBI and the CIA and everybody saying the Hunter Biden laptop was fake. That's election interference. I mean, nothing uh, that Russia has done has come close to that. Yes. And also, remember the uh, you mentioned Michigan. Remember the fake Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot that the FBI yeah. planned uh, just so they could meddle in the 2020 election? The uh, the Fed napping. It's like. Is how many times do we need to be screwed with by these guys, and then they have the audacity to get up there and give a big press conference about how they're protecting us? Oh, I mean, it's just absurd. It's just like uh, uh, you know, I saw today again another person going after 
uh, you know, well, you can't vote for Trump. He's a felon. It's like, well, you guys invented the whole thing. In fact, a Justice Department guy just got caught on secret cameras saying, yeah, it's complete BS. I mean, it's an abuse of the system. Uh, and everybody knows that. The only reason why they did it is to be able to say that Donald Trump is a felon, and now they're going to sentence him to jail in the next two weeks. Uh, and everybody knows it's bogus. It's just that when it finally gets pushed away on appeal, uh, it will be well after the election. I mean, th- why? I mean, think about it. How many cases uh, can come up in one year just? coincidentally i mean uh, how much time has donald trump spent in the court yeah uh, under gag orders that's so, all grotesque election interference so so there's a you know i don't think americans um i don't think they're they're swayed by this lawfare meaning like what they think of trump is already baked in the cake like if you're the yeah. kind of if you're if you're somebody who just hates him because he exists and he represents the opposing party then you're going to buy this idea that he is uh, guilty of all these felonies simultaneously and that prosecuting him just within the last year, uh, it all makes total sense to you because he's a criminal and the law finally caught up with him. The, meanwhile, the rest of the country is like, this guy's being put upon. This is a scam. Yeah. This is and, – and so my view – and tell me if I'm wrong, David. I don't, I don't think that in the end this has really done anything but really – but in the end kind of help him actually to the extent that as people assess this, they're going, why are you martyring this guy? Why are you giving him this unfair treatment? Well, Trump has never been as popular in the polls as he is today. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what it has done is hardened people on both sides. I think if they had not done this, I mean, one of the reasons they did this is they wanted Trump instead of someone else on the ticket, thinking that he would be easier to beat than, say, Ron DeSantis. So, you know, they dropped things. Uh, during the uh, whole primary process, just as they give money uh, to Trump-endorsed candidates or the most uh, extreme right-wingers because they think they can can beat them more easily. Uh, it, but this election cycle, they they basically use it all up. There's no more gas in the tank when it comes to attacking Donald Trump. I mean, it's like talking to someone and they say, well, if only people knew this. It's like people cannot know more about Donald Trump. It's just <laughs> physically impossible. I know. I mean, he I said it. He, he said it himself. It was like a podcast earlier this week. He's like, nobody's received more publicity than me. Is everywhere you go. Is every television you turn on, every newspaper. Like everybody's constantly talking about me. I, he's, he said, I could use less publicity. I'm the only person, he said, who would ever need to hire a PR firm to get less publicity? Because yeah. uh, that's because that is true. It's it's just an, kind of an obsessive, never-ending conversation. Yeah, I I think that uh, very little of this has to do with swaying anybody's votes anymore. It's all about juicing or depressing people's excitement to go out right. and vote. Right. Right. And uh, you know. That, uh, if you look at what happened with the switcheroo between Harris and Biden, all you really saw was, uh, you know, Democrats who were depressed coming back, uh, you know, into the fold. And the election today is almost a mirror image of where it was before the debate. And, you know, to the extent that that's true, I think it's a bad thing for Kamala because. Yeah. Uh, so, well, let me. I want to get more of, of your thoughts on that, why it's bad for Kamala in a moment, but just on this theory, I, I've been thinking a lot about this because Kamala was detested by the left and by the American people uh, uh, not that long ago. It was like two, three months ago. And then the switcheroo happened. Then all of a sudden, there's this like amazement. They're like, oh, she's so great. And then you're watching this reinvention by the media. Her polling is rising to the level of where, as you pointed out, uh, Biden was some time ago. And, and, I've been thinking the analogy that's been going through my head is, you know, when you were a little kid and you would jump, if, if you ever did this, you jump between a hot tub and a pool and you, and, and you, yes. you enjoy the difference in temperature. I think that's what Democrats did. Like they, like they're normally, it's just a lukewarm, boring pool. That's Kamala Harris. But they, they went from a situation where they're switching back and forth. They're like, well, we got rid of that guy. Thank God they were sweating it with with Trump. So now Kamala coming in, she seems like a cool breeze. It's a really nice relief for them. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think there were uh, a lot of independents who were double haters who flirted and have been flirting with the idea that maybe Kamala is, you know, a better alternative. Uh, and ironically, the first few weeks of being the generic Democrat who's just acting happy helped her. Yeah. Uh, but that honeymoon is over. People actually want to hear things. And, you know, I think if the election were held two weeks ago, uh, you know, she probably would have won it. I think the election not be, you know, it's, it's now, what, two months away? Yes. I think that right now she is in a terrible spot. Do you uh, think she, she do, you, do you think she has a lot to lose in this debate? I do. Uh, I, I think the best that she can do is survive it because she really has. Uh, it, it's hard to overestimate how horrible she is. I mean, she's just not very bright. Uh, she has failed upwards. And, you know, yeah. so her goal is to survive this debate. Well, her but, campaign is clearly uh, scared of her speaking uh, in any ad-libbed capacity. They're, they're, they're very fearful of it. I, I think – I think that's probably the best indication that uh, the debate is a place where she's going to be in a lot of peril. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I don't know if most people have noticed this, but Tim Waltz hasn't said anything either. I mean, everything they do is 100 percent scripted. Uh, and, you know, the one time that she comes out of that on the CNN uh, uh, interview. Yes. She was at best met. And actually, it was pretty bad. Uh, you know, it was not campaign killing bad, but it really, the, she didn't look joyful. She didn't look smart. She didn't look in touch with anything. No. And they even, you know, they screwed up to the point where they made her look like a midget compared to Dana Bash and Tim <laughs> Waltz. I mean, uh, it, it, it's just bizarre. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and Walls uh, knows how to talk, so, by the way. Like Walls, Walls could do an interview. I mean, in fact, in the weeks leading up to him becoming the running mate, he did like a thousand MSNBC interviews. J Trump is weird. JD Vance is weird. They constantly had him on. But yeah. now that he's a part of the campaign, the real problem is they don't actually have policies. They don't have exactly. not policies they want to articulate. So what is Walls going to say if he's asked questions? He has no idea what the campaign's policies are. They're running a weather vane campaign right now. They're like, well, what does the American people want? They want a border. Oh, we're for borders. This is what they're doing yeah. in these final days. Yeah, and I I think that it, they're trying to run out the clock, but the clock is too long. It turns out that even a three-and-a-half-month campaign looks way too long for these people. Uh, you know, it's a Hollywood production, and what we've got here is the acolyte. Uh, you know, the, the horrible Star Wars thing, you know, they've got the girl <laughs> boss, you know, they've got the, you know, LGBTQ characters, they, you know, uh, it's, it's like all these people got in the room and said, what do we want to push on people? And they picked all the things. And the problem is they don't have a story that works. No. And, uh, you know, so just like the Acolyte, which got huge ratings in the first couple episodes, uh, they're starting to lose people. Now, I don't think that, that the trajectory is absolutely set. Trump can lose that. For sure. Uh, uh, there's no question because really you're only fighting over, you know, three or four percent. Uh, elections are won on margins. I mean, uh, you know, at his worst, uh, Joe Biden, who was drooling in front of the nation, was still within striking distance because Democrats are so set and Republicans are so set. So we're fighting over a small number of people in the middle. And so anything could happen. But the trajectory is horrible right now for Kamala Harris. Yeah. I mean, Nate Silver uh, now has Trump at a 60 percent chance of winning. I was just and telling I was just saying it to the audience just before you came yeah. on. Actually, I was reading his numbers. Uh, and again, as, as I pointed out, to be generous to him, he's just giving you a percentage chance of victory. So even a 40 percent chance is a good are good odds. But uh, th this is this is the, the best position that Trump has been in in a very long time. Yeah, I, I, I would have to say if I were to put money down today, 
uh, it would be on Donald Trump. And that's even assuming a fair amount of, uh, let's say, rule changing. And, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say that they were fixing the election, but, you know, they're certainly going to put their thumb on the scale. Meddling. Yeah, meddling's a big thing. Yeah, no, that, that it's yeah. happening all the time. Just ask RFK. Just ask Donald Trump. Just ask yes. every time they've they've tried to fix these ballots across the country. There, there's no question they have an, a, an insatiable appetite for for rigging where they can. Uh, that's that's definitely true. Um, all right, hey, uh, David Strom. I wish we could go for hours. We should. Uh, I'll talk to you again soon, sir. Terry, Falling Waters, West Virginia, line one. Terry, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hi, Vince. How are you doing today? So good, Terry. What's on your mind? Uh, I have two points. The first one has to do with the flip-flops that we've been seeing from the Democratic Party. Yeah. And I've been an uh, advocate for short commercials, 30, 45 seconds, that actually use Kamala's voice, Walsh's voice, Biden's voice, and show exactly how they're flip-flopping. Yes. And the Trump campaign did that, but it broadcast on Fox. You know, it, it, com- I, I don't know. Uh, so, so they only they only uh, they only posted that ad to Fox because remember, she said my values have not changed. And then they ran a big spot uh, that included a bunch of her statements from the past. And then they just kept peppering in. My values have not changed. You said you said that only ran on Fox. I've only seen it on Fox, but to be honest, I don't watch a lot of news broadcasts from oh, okay. the other stations. And, and, you know, one of the things to remember is sometimes they don't buy ads at the national level. They drill down to the battleground states and they'll buy ads on local television. But you, you want them to emphasize right. the flip-flops. I want them to use very short, 30-second, uh, 45-second uh, commercial Yeah, because the— the channels can't deny running those commercials. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. Without and, food. And in fact, in addition to that, uh, you need guys like J.D. Vance and perhaps even Vivek Ramaswamy, guys who have this encyclopedic memory who can go on TV and battle it out when they can break through. I've got some audio, actually, of Vivek doing that this week, and it came out great, and it really ticked off CNN. Hey, good afternoon to you. It is now 535, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us today, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Uh, Hunter Biden has just pled guilty to uh, the charges, the federal ta- tax fraud charges, uh, tax evasion charges. And here is his attorney, Abby Lowell, has just stepped up to the microphones uh, beginning moments ago, I'm going to see if I can't give you this audio. Take a listen. After watching prosecutors exploit his family's peace during the Delaware trial and realizing that they were planning to do it again here in California, Hunter decided to enter his plea to protect those he loves from unnecessary hurt and cruel humiliation. This plea prevents that kind of show trial that would have not provided all the facts or served any real point in justice. He will now move on to the sentencing phase while keeping open the options to raise the many clear issues with this case on appeal. There's no doubt this case was an extreme and unusual one for the government to bring. Like millions of Americans, Hunter was late in filing and paying his taxes. Unlike those millions of Americans, he was charged criminally for his failures that occurred during the depths of his addiction to drugs and alcohol, and which, he has rectified by paying his overdue taxes in full with interest and penalties. I mean, actually, there was a, uh, it was, who was that guy? Uh, it was his sugar brother who was doing, Kevin Morris, who was paying all of this off. It wasn't, it wasn't Hunter. 
Uh, Kevin Morris apparently loaned him the money to pay off his taxes. There's a lot of loans going on in the Biden family to avoid paying taxes. Years before he was ever charged. In fact, Hunter actually overpaid his taxes in the year he was charged with tax evasion. Okay, so, so uh, summary of, of what we've heard so far. Hunter Biden's just like you. He doesn't pay his taxes. Hunter Biden was on drugs. Stop picking on him. Hunter Biden's trying to protect his family, which is why he's not allowing this thing to drag into trial. And Hunter Biden, in fact, overpaid his taxes. So again, stop hassling him. Hunter put his family first today. And it was a brave and loving thing for him to do. Does he want to party? Why did he wait till this morning? Why did he wait till this morning? That's it. Uh, Abby Lowell turns turns tail, walks away. He's he's done. That's the statement. So uh, Hunter Biden has pled guilty uh, in that court. Earlier today, his uh, move was he was trying to plead innocent but will accept guilty. I think that's it was they called it an Alford plea. Uh, and the uh, the court and the prosecutors were like, "You're not doing that. That's crazy." Uh, so he's pled guilty today uh, so that there won't be a trial. Uh, of course, this is designed to prevent the trial from in any way arresting Kamala's rise. Don't want that getting in the way during the presidential election. Uh, and, uh, and, a, and of course, a pardon is, uh, is imminent. It's, it's en route. Uh, so we'll see, of course, when that happens. Uh, that is the update there on, on Hunter Biden. Uh, we've got, uh, I wanted to share with you this, this idea of going after uh, Kamala for being a flip-flopper. There's a bunch of good ways this is being done. One of them is this ad that uh, the Trump team put together uh, saying that she is a flip-flopper and uh, this whole, that she told CNN recently her values have not changed. My values have not changed. Juice red meat specifically. Yes. The Boston Marathon bomber. They should be able to vote. I think we should have that conversation. Abolish ICE. Yes. Would you ban offshore drilling? Yes. And I'm in favor of banning fracking. I am prepared to pass a Green New Deal. I support a mandatory buyback program. We're not going to treat people who are undocumented across the border as criminals. The idea that more police equals more safety. That's just wrong. Policing, as we know, goes all the way back to slave patrols and that idea. Yes, you are absolutely right. Where do you stand on defund the police? We need to take a look at these budgets. Do you ban and plastic straws. I think we should. 70 to 80 percent tax rate. I think that's fantastic. Chipping now to the Minnesota Freedom Fund. How dare we speak Merry Christmas? And yeah, I am radical. I do <laughs> believe that we need to get radical about what we are doing. Kamala Harris failed week, dangerously liberal. The ad ends with on screen. So uh, yeah, that's a great ad. Perfect. And the kind of thing that they should be reminding people of. Uh, heading into Election Day. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy went on CNN this week. And, uh, you know, you got to be careful. When you hand that guy the microphone, he's going to run with it. You brought up some claims about Kamala Harris. I want to finish that discussion. She said she didn't favor a ban on fracking now. The reality is she was one of the strongest proponents of that ban, so much so that when she was in California, she sued the Obama administration over granting fracking permits. She didn't just favor the abolition of private health insurance. She was a co-sponsor of the bill with Bernie Sanders as a U.S. senator for Medicare for All for Americans. The reality is that when you think about the Green New Deal, she was the chief proponent, not just as a co-sponsor of the legislation, but going further and saying she would end the filibuster in the Senate to ram that through. So the reality is she can say what she wants to say now. Those are actions she has taken. Is someone allowed to evolve? Of course they are. But she deserves to explain exactly why she's changed those positions, exactly what her position is. If it's not a ban on fracking, what exactly is it? What exactly is her health care plan if she no longer favors abolishing private health insurance, which just four short years ago when she ran for president, she did. And that's the kind of scrutiny that's been missing. I think Donald Trump has received plenty of scrutiny, and I give credit to him for sitting for hostile interviews that Kamala Harris has not. Yeah, just just rattling them off, Vivek. Uh... In, in many ways, uniquely equipped to do it. Very talented. J.D. Vance is also very capable of that. Uh, you know, President Trump's got his own fighting style, but it's not usually encyclopedic recitations of everything Kamala Harris has ever said or done. Uh, so that's, and that's, he's got utility players for that. He's got J.D. Vance. He's got uh, 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 people like Vivek who can do that really, really well. Uh, so to the extent that they can get these guys on those networks, fantastic. President Trump will have his own opportunity this coming week, of course, uh, on that debate stage. All right, your calls are coming in, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. 
Let's bring in Chris from Bethesda now, line five. Chris, good afternoon. So you're on the Vince Colony Show. Vince, in my opinion, and I'm, a, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but in my opinion, <laughs> Me neither. this whole thing, you know, I mow grass. My, he's, he's pleading guilty to rush this thing so that he can get to the sentencing phase or however this stuff works. Yeah. So that his dad can pardon him before his dad gets booted from office, in my opinion. That's a, I, I think that's what a, happens with appeals I, and everything. But. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a reasonable opinion. I guess one thing that I've I've thought about quite a bit, and uh, I'll let I'll let the attorneys, the smarter guys among us, uh, uh, weigh in on this. But I will say that um, you've got in in history, Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon was a a, a preemptive pardon. They, he he comes flying in with a pardon that says uh, no. No, you're not, you can't charge him with any crimes he may have even committed. Uh, and that pardon is available, uh, apparently, at every step of the process. So a guilty plea today, a finding of guilty, you know, you got to imagine that uh, Joe Biden could can intercept it uh, starting now or even if the trial were to drag out. But I, uh, your impulse, though, your instinct, I think, is right. This, this, is, this is more about political hijinks than it is any sort of, like, actual uh, attempt to, to render justice. Right. Well, great show, Vince. Thanks, Thanks for Man, I mowing grass. I I do like mowing grass. That's there's some catharsis in that. We got my tall fescue. Got to get nice nice rows into it. Uh, let's see. I've got. Is it Ami? Uh, is it yeah Omi in Woodbridge? All right, Omi is on line four. Omi, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony show. Hello, Omi. Check check one two. Is this thing on? Omi. All right. No Omi. Um, Omi's point also well taken. He he wanted to mention that he thinks that this is uh, done within the context of Trump's sentencing, uh, that Trump's sentencing is coming up. And therefore, the last thing the left needs is any other legal distractions hanging on, uh, which is an excellent point. They want to imprison this guy and they don't want you don't want Hunter Biden to be in the midst of some sort of trial. Uh, at the same time. So it, it, let's clear the deck. Let me take Sam in Alexandria, line three. Sam, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. You know, all of us political junk, junkies, especially in bursting radius of D.C., I know we've been thinking and wondering, you know, what the president's uh, approach is going to be as he goes on the debate stage uh and i was wondering what your thoughts are uh and then i'll if you don't mind i'll follow up on what i think it should be what his approach should be next week on the debate stage uh yeah. well well for one i totally agree that it should be about the flip-flops what kamala harris actually believes and what she's advocated for and what she what she actually stands for and really this idea that she's trying to run away from the fact that she is the vice president right now. All of this day one chatter that they've been doing. On day one, I'm going to do this. I, I have a feeling that President Trump is going to rest really reliably on this point, which is you've had three and a half years. We know what it looks like. People are poorer. We're in the midst of all of these wars. There's all sorts of chaos going on. People are dying due to the fentanyl crisis. Uh, you could... There's a long list of horribles that he could he could put out there. But reminding the American people uh, and perhaps some who really haven't thought about it too deeply that she has been the vice president and she has cast all of these tie breaking votes. And she was the yeah. last person in the room on some of the most most consequential decisions. That's key. One other element here. And then, Sam, I would love to get your thoughts on this. I think that this 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 system that they've now both agreed to where they once again mute the microphones. I think President Trump and his campaign wisely sensed that that, that last debate ended up better than they even expected with the microphones being muted uh, when you're, it's not your turn to speak. And the reason for that uh, is because Joe Biden, he was meandering through his thoughts and he wasn't able to stick the landing because he's senile. And that microphone would go off and President Trump would suddenly be able to speak and he would be able to give you commentary on what you just witnessed, the collapse that you just saw on national television. I think the same thing is going to be available to him with Kamala Harris. She has she's notoriously incapable of ad libbed commentary, especially when it involves trying to pull the wool over your eyes. If she's trying to mislead you, 
she doesn't really know how to talk it through. She's she's accustomed mm -hmm. to hiding her true feelings. She's accustomed to pretending to have human conversations. And when she gets up there and she starts speaking in sort of mindless poetry, she, she may run into a few brick walls here when that timer goes off. And when it does, that'll be Donald Trump's chance to pounce. So I, I, uh, I think that that's what I'm expecting next week, Sam. What are you expecting? Yeah, you know what? I absolutely agree with you. And I was looking more big picture as in <clears throat> making sure as far as coming across presidential, let her bury herself. And, you know, with the with the mic off uh, comment that you made is that allows him to take a deep breath, gather his thoughts. OK, what is she saying or trying to say? And let me bring it back to the point I want to make, I think will be devastating. The biggest thing is he's got all of, you know, all of us Trumpsters. Yeah. The point is appearing because I want this to be an absolute uh, curb stomp, tidal wave, crushing defeat. And the way he does that is come across as presidential, which yep. he cannot. And in every sense, is, like you said, well, you've had three and a half years. You were the number two. Could you not influence him in a way that would make him reconsider the train wreck that we now see as our economy? Yeah, you own this, Kamala. Those kind of things. You own this, yeah. and oh. that's going to be that's going to be yeah. a big deal. And this muted microphone thing. Remember where it came from? It came from the idea that that the Democrats didn't want Trump interrupting. That was what they were worried about. Yeah. Oh, Trump's going to interrupt. He's going to disrupt everything, right? And and now uh -huh. the reason Kamala is so furious about it, her campaign is furious that the mics will be muted, is because they wanted her to interrupt him. That's what they yeah. desired. They weren't. They're not worried about Trump interrupting. They are actually eager to try and step on his message because like everybody else on the left, to include the media, the last thing they want you to hear is Donald Trump uninterrupted. Absolutely, and, and one closing thought is, and I'm gonna start tomorrow. <clears throat> it's the end of the season, brother, and my flip-flops go into my closet, well, mm -hmm. maybe in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but I got a spare set. I'm gonna either put those on the trailer hitch of Big Baby or I'm going to take tape one of those suckers on the back of the Harley. So if you support Trump, then show the symbol of the flip flop of Kamala. And every Trump rally could be a wave of people waving the flip flops up in the air. Uh, well, Sam, if I get on the beltway and I start seeing flip flops hanging off of all these uh, towing hitches, I'll know where that came from. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, you got it, brother. You take care. Good, to, good to hear from you today. And, and you know it's fun. You know it's a fun, a fun game to play. You ever drive on the, drive on the highways around here, and you look around and you wonder what people are listening to in their cars. You're like, I wonder how many people are listening to WMAL right now. Sometimes I think oh, we should do a big experiment. You know, a big, a giant, community wide experiment. Everyone honk right now, <laughs> and then see what happens. It'd be pretty funny. We did a segment years ago on the morning show when I was hosting the morning show. We we, we talked about car habits. Did I ever tell you this, Corey? It was a, it was like the kinds of things that people do in their cars. And it was just a, it was just one of those like the top 10 things people do in their cars. Uh, and one of them on the list was pick your nose. It was pick your nose. Somebody, people pick their nose in their car. And uh, we, we said that on the air and somebody called in immediately and they go, uh, Vince, I, I swear to you, the second you said that, I looked to my side and there was a guy with his finger <laughs> right up his nostril. I was like, well, you know. There are windows. You, you're not completely alone. Look around. It's five. President Trump last night in Pennsylvania. He wanted to do a debate on the Fox News channel. Kamala Harris was too scared to do that. So they decided to sub in a town hall with President Trump, Pennsylvania voters. Uh, and here's one of the uh, messages he has for voters, including voters who don't like him, he said. You have 500,000 jobs. Think of that. It's your biggest business. And you get a big majority of your income from fracking and you have somebody that's not going to allow fracking she's not going to allow it you can't take the chance you have no choice you've got to vote for me you've got to vote for me <laughs> even even if you don't like me you know yeah. it's it's anyway. No, but even if you don't like me, you can sit there and say, I can't stand that guy, but there's no way I'm going to vote for her. No, you have to have fracking. <laughs> what a campaign. Have you ever heard any candidate ever say that? Even if you don't like me, even if you can't stand me, there's no way you can have her. 
Uh, pretty funny. Uh, Trump today was uh, speaking in New York as well. He said that Kamala keeps stealing all of his ideas and trying to campaign on them so much so that he said, I got to send her a MAGA cap. She got up, said no tax on tips. I said, I just said that. She is actually copying a lot of my plan. In fact, we're going to send her a MAGA cap sometime in the next week. We're having a special one May. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. Hey, uh, I've got some good news for you. Interesting news for you. You know, Corey and Ganimore, He'll be manning the microphone tomorrow for me. Uh, it should be. I have, I have an interesting day tomorrow. Don't tr uh, Trust me, I'll share it with you soon. Uh, but in the meantime, Corey is going to take over tomorrow. And up next here on the legendary WMAL, the great one, Mark Levin. Have a great evening.